Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's webcast. Today we have Jared Smith presenting the economic impact of open source on small business. Today's webcast is sponsored by Bluehost, and while it's obvious that open source makes an enormous contribution to the economy, the exact impact is difficult to quantify. This summer, Bluehost and O'Reilly worked together to explore the world of open source and to quantify the economic impact on the small business economy. This webcast today expounds on the conclusions offered in the July 2012 O'Reilly Radar Report with additional insight drawn from the real-world data provided by Bluehost. And folks, we would like to let you know you can access that radar report. It is available in the green file folder, which is located in your widget tray. I will turn the program over to Jared in just a moment, but first I'd like to go over some housekeeping things to help you get the most out of today's webcast. You'll want to open the group chat widget if you haven't already done so. This is where we can interact with each other during the event and where you can submit your questions for Jared. We find that our audience usually has a lot of good knowledge to share, so we encourage you to chat freely during the event. However, if you have questions for Jared, please preface them with a capital letter Q so we know that they're for him and we can make sure he sees it for Q&A. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you'd like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you'll need to give it permission to access your account, and it will automatically append the event's hashtag to your tweets so you don't have to. If you have any problems during the event, please take a look at the Help widget. If you continue to have problems, please post it in the group chat, and one of our staff will help you right away. For choppy audio or stalled visuals, please try refreshing your window. And remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is to close out any apps that could be interfering. People always ask, so we'd like you to know. We are recording today's webcast, and we'll have an archive ready usually within 48 hours. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Jared for his presentation. Hello, Jared. Thanks, Yasmina. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, this webcast uh, talking about the economic impact of open source on small business. Um, as Yasmina said, my name is Jared Smith, and I'm a, I'm a geek. Um, I currently work for, uh, for Bluehost. Um, I'm their director of open source outreach, which means I have the best job in the world. My job is to help give back to open source communities, help strengthen and grow open source communities. And one of the things that, that we've done at Bluehost over the past several months is work together with O'Reilly on this uh, O'Reilly radar report to call an economic impact of open source on small business, a, a case study. And the webcast today is really set up to kind of go through some of the conclusions we were able to draw from this uh, research report that we did with O'Reilly, as well as to give folks um, an idea of what impact the open source really has on, on the economy and particularly on the small business economy out there. Um, so just, just out of curiosity, uh, for, for people who are on the group chat, I'm curious to know how many people have actually gone out and looked at the report that we did? Has anybody downloaded the PDF and flipped through it? Um, go ahead and just, uh, if, you, if, if you've got the group chat open, go ahead and, and let me know if you've, if you've downloaded that and, uh, and looked at that. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and push out a, a URL as well for those of you who have not uh, read the report. Um, you should have, a, have a, a URL that you can click on there to, to go ahead and launch that, uh, that in a new tab in your browser and, and go ahead and download the PDF of that report. It's a, it's a great report and we want to share it with everyone um, so that that's there and available. So uh, feel free to click on that, that link. I'll also push it out at the end of the, the, the webcast as well so that people can uh, click on it then as well in case they're a few minutes late joining us here. So I want to start out talking about the, the report and talking about kind of what our, what our premise was for, for writing this report. Um, this report came out of a conversation that, that happened between Tim O'Reilly 
and the CEO of Bluehost parent company, uh, a man by the name of Hari Ravichandran, um, Tim and Hari were talking, and Hari was talking about ways that he could give back to the open source community, uh, creative and interesting ways to, to really make an impact. And one of the things that Tim suggested was um, doing a research paper on the open source contribution to the economy. Everybody's got the economy on their minds. And so uh, at, at Tim's suggestion, we, uh, we went back and, and, and looked at some of our data and uh, worked with the folks at O'Reilly to, to really write up a, a, a paper that helps us explore this topic. Um, now, measuring the, the economic impact of open source is, is not easy um, because a lot of the, the measurements aren't there. Um, obviously, we could go out and look at the usual suspects, you know, companies like Red Hat or that, you know, have, a, have an easy and, and direct way of, of measuring, you know, how they're able to, to uh, capitalize on, on open source. Um, but really, the world of open source comes down to what uh, Tim O'Reilly likes to call a hidden economy. And let me explain the hidden economy with, with one of the, the things that uh, Tim O'Reilly talked about in his keynote at the OzCon conference earlier this summer. In his uh, keynote, Tim talked about what he calls the clothesline paradox. And the clothesline paradox came out of a book uh, that was published in the 70s, and it goes like this. He says, if you take your clothesline, if you take down your clothesline and you buy an electric dryer, the electric consumption of the nation rises slightly. And then the economists can go and they can measure the energy usage and they can you know, measure the revenue generated from the companies that build the electric clothes dryers and, and so on and so forth. If you were to go the other direction, however, and remove your dryer and put up a clothesline, then obviously the, the, the electricity consumption drops slightly, but nobody's giving credit anywhere on the charts and the graphs and the economic reports to solar energy, which is now responsible for drying your clothes. And I think there's a lot of hidden economies out there. Obviously, you know, open source is one of those. Um, but there's others out there as well. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you have a garden and you produce some of your own produce, um, nobody's measuring that as, as far as that being part of the GDP, even though you, you're benefiting from that. If you're doing, you know, doing your own car repairs or doing your own home repairs, those are other examples of, of hidden economies. The one we want to focus on here today is, is the open source economy. It's not an easy thing to measure um, because there's – it's not typically directly monetized. It makes it difficult to say how, how big is, exactly is that impact. Um, you know, if we can't measure that impact, then how do we tell is that if that impact is growing larger and larger every year? So we took a step back and, and, and asked ourselves, how could we go about trying to measure, at least in, in some small way, what the impact of open source is on the small business economy? There's really two markets that, that help us um, measure that directly. Um, the first is the, is the Internet service provider market. Um, the, the Internet service providers play a unique role in, in the economy these days because they, they help people um, you know, get on the Internet. You know, they provide a, a connection um, you know, to, to, for you to, to get on the Internet. But they also uh, provide tools, you know, such as some of them offer email you know, hosting or web hosting or or other, other services out there. Um, and it's, it's hard to, to tell how much of the, you know, the $79 billion ISP market out there in the United States every year is directly attributable to open source. But it should be fairly obvious that, that the majority of the services that are people are using on the Internet, things like Google, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and millions of other websites, are really driven by open source and open source communities. And so obviously that's the, the ISP market out there is one way that we can help, help measure what is the impact of open source on the, on the economy. Another uh, area that's uh, probably a little easier to measure, um, the impact of open source on the economy, is, is through web hosting, through companies like, like Bluehost. Obviously a big percentage of our, you know, our, our revenue, the, a big percentage of the, of the money that the, the, the hosts make out there, um, is directly attributable to things like the Apache web server, um, mail servers like Postfix and Exum and SendMail. 
um, to um, domain name programs like Bind, um, you know, these, these, these sorts of applications. And so, you know, we, we, we figure that the, that the web hosting market out there, um, especially, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the shared hosting space and VPS space is probably about um, $5 billion a year, roughly. And so um, we, we sat down and said, well, as a, as a web host, can we look at, at the data that we have and can we do some surveys with our customers to try to figure out, you know, what, what impact, you know, more precisely what impact open source has on, on those economies. Um, so that, that's what we, we, we sat down, uh, looked through uh, some anonymous uh, usage data from our own customers, um, both, both customers from Bluehost and some of the other subsidiaries of our parent company, Endurance International. And so at the time this report was written, we, um, you know, Endurance International and its Bluehost subsidiary hosted about 7 million domains or more than 2 million um, customer accounts, most of which are small and medium-sized businesses. Um, since the paper was written, um, Endurance International has also acquired HostGator, which added approximately 5 million more domains and another 650,000 businesses and resellers to that per portfolio. So that gives you an idea that, you know, somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of the, of the hosting market is, is reflected in this survey. Um, we also send out a, a customer survey to our customers and ask them to, to fill that out and send that back to us. And we got about 4,000 responses to that survey, so we feel confident that we've got a, a statistically significant sample size to be able to go in and look at you know, what really is the, the impact of, of open source on, on our customers and certainly on the economy. So let's, let's dive in a little bit to the data um, just to get a feel for, for the Bluehost customers, um, what they're using, um, why that, they think that's important, and, uh, and then we'll dive into the economic impact as well. Before I dive into the, the, the customer data, though, uh, I, I will point out that I do like feedback as I'm giving the webcast. Sometimes when you're giving a webcast, you, you can't see people's faces, so it's hard to tell are people paying attention, do they have questions, or, you know, those sorts of things. So again, feel free to use either the group chat functionality within the, the webcast software here, or use the, the, the Q&A tab to add questions. Um, and I'll, I'll try to answer those questions as I go along. So let's, let's dive into the, the customer data here for a minute. Um, about 71% of the, of the customers that, that, that we surveyed um, are small or medium-sized businesses. Um, obviously, um, those are who we're trying to, trying to you know, identify. Those are the ones we're trying to, to figure out the impact of. Um, to this survey, so we thought that was that was important. Of those 71 percent, um, about nine percent are nonprofits, and the rest are for-profit companies. Um, the average domain uh, from our usage data had been active for 35 months, um, with an average rate of seven dollars and 49 cents per month. Um, that cost per month has actually gone down over the past two years by about a dollar per month. Um, and that's due to you know increased competitiveness in the market and uh, obviously increased economies of scale. Um, of, those, uh, of those account, approximately 77% uh, have a, a relational database of some sort, something like MySQL or Postgres. Um, and the, the average account has roughly 3.8 database schemas, meaning that we're fairly confident that the, you know, the majority of those out there are either you know, serving up dynamic data through their website, or they're capturing um, data from their customers. Maybe it's account signups, or maybe it's customer information, or surveys, or those sorts of things. But it, it tends to be fairly, fairly dynamic um, content and not just static content out there. Um, of those, of those roughly you know million accounts that we we used in the sample here, 32% um, of those accounts had their email hosted with us as well and had an average of seven mailboxes per account. Um, I want to take just a minute and look at the, the information about the customer sophistication. Obviously, um, some of the customers we have are, are, are quite web savvy. Others uh, are just beginning uh, to get on the web and understand you know, what makes the web tick. Um, so looking at that survey data, 31% of, of the respondents identified themselves as beginners. 
40% is intermediate, 15% uh, is advanced, and then the top 14% listed themselves as uh, professional web developers or designers. Uh, another really interesting uh, piece of data that came out uh, was uh, people, people responded whether they built the website themselves or whether they had someone else uh, build the website for them. Um, in 75% of the responses, um, they built the website themselves, uh, and 25% had someone else build, build it for them. Of that 25%, roughly half had a, had a friend or a coworker build their site for them. Uh, the other half um, hired a third party company to build their website. So we, as, as a web hosting company, we, you know, that, that number you know, gives us confidence that even though you know, the majority of the, of the customers rank themselves as beginners or in, intermediate users um, of web development, um, the majority are still able to go out, um, use open source tools to build the site themselves, and, and get up and running with, with a minimum amount of third party help. One of the other uh, questions we asked in our, in our user survey was, why, why do you have a website? Um, you know, what is your reason for having a website? Uh, from that, we saw that 48% uh, of the respondents uh, use their website you know, if to, to represent their business uh, without an online store. 22% responded as, as, as the site is being personal in nature. 12% uh, um, were running a business that included an online store and then 9% were nonprofits or, or informational websites. A um, couple other interesting uh, pieces to come out of that data. Uh, one that uh, I, f I found very interesting is that 36% of the respondents said that they derived the majority of their business income from, from the business associated with their website, um, and uh, another 33% um, said that, 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 that that, you know, part part time, you know, part part of their income came from the from the, the business associated with their website. So that that shows just how important uh, you know, it, it is to have a website and, and how it can help your your small business. You know, one of the things we pointed out uh, at the OzCon conference in, in one of the keynotes was that uh, typically, you know, when a, when a small business starts these days, if it starts on the web, it, it really is global in nature. It's not just aimed at the at the neighborhood where the where the business exists, or it's not just dependent on people who walk through the front door of a of a traditional brick and mortar store. Um, but really, it, it's it it you you you've, you've got a global reach, you've got a global audience if you've got a web presence, and it doesn't matter where your customers are. In many cases, they could be halfway around the world. It's nice that, it, that it, the, the internet really gives businesses this reach. Okay, I've got a question that came through the group chat. Uh, they ask, what percentage of web hosting users who install and use open source scripts or modules convert to paying a subscription or other fee to use a more feature-rich version of that script or module? Um, that's something that we didn't uh, particularly address in, in this survey. Um, we uh, you know, my my gut feeling look in looking at the data and, and, and going through this is that that the majority of the users, um, the majority of the people are are using mostly open source scripts, um, where people tend to add on um, additional modules, um, you know, subscription fees, that sort of thing, are typically either themes for um, content management systems, particularly, or uh, Know, additional help with, with custom modules for, for content management systems. Um, but the vast majority that, that, that I saw looking through the data uh, were simply using open source um, scripts or modules. Um, we also found that the, the, the majority of the people were, you know, prefer to use open source um, tools um, rather than proprietary tools such as content management systems or e-commerce systems, those sorts of things. Hopefully that helps answer that question. Um, one of the other questions we, we ask um, when we went through the, the, the customer data in, in our survey here was, what would be the economic impact um, if your website went down and, and was out for an extended period of time? What, what impact would that have on your business? 51% um, you know, of the small and medium-sized businesses reported that, that, that that would have a detrimental impact on their business. 
another 19 uh, percent said it would significantly hurt their business, and another 9 percent on top of that said that they would be completely out of business if, they, if their website went down. So it just shows you that how, how important to these uh, small and medium-sized businesses um, you know, web, a web presence is. We took a, a little deeper dive on, on those who were running e-commerce sites. Um, and of those, um, we asked them how, how they collect payments. And uh, PayPal was the obvious winner in that, uh, in that category. 53% um, of the sites uh, collected uh, money online via PayPal. Um, another 26% uh, via credit cards, um, with the credit card transaction happening online. 12% um, uh, via check or money order or electronic check. And then uh, uh, the final in that one was 9% with credit cards taking, taken over, only over the phone. Um, and then one other one other question that I that I had added to the survey because I thought it was important is is to find out you know do these do these people who are going out and building a website do they know that they're using open source are they familiar with the term open source have they uh, have they heard the term open source and looking at the at the responses to that question um, nearly two thirds of the respondents said yes they were familiar with the term open source so I think uh, we we in the open source community are doing a good job of of, of getting the word out there, to helping people understand what, what open source is. And uh, that's always good to, to, to see data like this to come back to really show you know, what, what that impact is. So let's, uh, oh, one other question here. To, to what do you attribute the, sec the success of PayPal versus credit cards? Um, obviously, um, I think that's ease of use. I think it's much easier to go out, go out and set up PayPal to accept payments in the majority of the cases than it is to go set up a, a credit card merchant account, um, set up the bank accounts necessary, get, get all that paperwork um, done. Having, having done that uh, before with several companies, um, it's, it's never an easy process to, to get set up with credit card transactions online, especially if you don't want to pay through the nose um, in, in transaction fees and those sorts of things. Um, and I think that's the reason I would attribute that PayPal is doing so well in that regard is they've, they've made it fairly simple and fairly painless to get up and running to accept payment. All right, let's, uh, let's move on a little bit here and, and dive more in, in, in a little bit more to the, um, to really the economic impact. We've looked at, you know, kind of why, why businesses get online and what they're doing online and, you know, what impact they would have if they went offline. Um, but let's talk about the economic impact for a minute. Um, we looked at a number of different things to try to gauge what the economic impact of the, uh, you know, of, of the open source economy is. Um, one, of the, one of the studies we looked at was a 2011 McKinsey study that basically said that small and medium-sized businesses who invest heavily in web technologies grow twice as fast as companies who make the lowest level of investment. So, in and of itself, just having a web presence um, and, and investing in, in that web presence can make a, make a huge difference in, in, in the performance of a small and medium-sized business. Um, and so one of the, one of the things we, we set out in the survey to do is, is, is we kind of postulated that open source is the, is the engine that helps drive small businesses online and that small businesses are the, the, really the economic engine of the U.S. economy. You know, looking at data from the Small Business Administration uh, website from the government, um, small and medium-sized businesses um, make up more than 50 percent of the, of the U.S. GDP. They make up the majority of it. Um, and uh, obviously they, you know, they uh, employ the majority of the people in the country as well. So that's, uh, that's kind of the, what we started from. And then we, we set out to say, okay, how can we measure on what that economic impact is. So there were two different things we looked at um, besides that McKinsey study. Um, the first question we set out to, to, to answer, and kind of going back to the, 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 to the clothesline paradox that we talked about earlier, was we decided to measure, well, can we tell what's the cost differential between you know, a, a, an open source solution in running open source software on servers as compared to, to running a, a proprietary software stack on those same servers. 
And we looked at a lot of different data and decided that the, probably the best proxy that we could use um, for, you know, a, a somewhat conservative model, but, but a fairly, fairly good proxy for measuring that data was looking at the Amazon EC2 cloud. Obviously, with the Amazon um, cloud, you can run either open source software on their servers or you can, you, you can run proprietary uh, software on those servers. And we looked at, you know, how many, you know, how many, how many accounts in our system would need databases and what size of databases would they need. You know, on the proprietary side, we, we said, well, okay, if they ran Microsoft Windows as the operating system, if they ran SQL Server as the database, um, you know, and, and kept trying to match apples to apples as, as best we could, you know, what would be the, what would be the cost differential there? Um, and again, I feel, feel free to dive through the, to the report and, and look at the actual math and the, and the exact numbers that we calculated out on that. But a very conservative estimate was that, that, that there's a two to one um, cost savings uh, ratio for, for using open source as the, as the platform for your hosting as opposed to using proprietary solutions. One of the other uh, interesting studies that we looked at was we looked at a, uh, a study that Google put out uh, a little while ago talking about online advertising and the, the economic impact of, of their AdWords advertising program. Um, and it was qu quite interesting to dive through that report. I won't go into, into too much detail on it here on the webcast today. But basically what the, what the short uh, version of that uh, Google AdWords study is, is, is that roughly um, businesses who go out and invest in AdWords, um, for every dollar they invest in, in, in online advertising with AdWords, they, they receive roughly $8 in, in benefit through, through new, new customer signups and, and that sort of thing. So uh, we, we thought that was fairly interesting as well, and so we worked that into, uh, into our model here and uh, tried, to, tried to use that as, as one gauge of how to, you know, how, to, how to gauge the economic impact. So let's dive in for a minute, and I want to look at a couple of, uh, a couple of case studies because I think they really help show um, what, what that impact is and how we measured that impact. Um, the first uh, case study that, that we want to talk about is a, is a company called Coco Knits. Um, Coco Knits is a, is a small, um, web-based company um, started by Julie Weigenberger. And Julie Weigenberger started this website because she wanted to put some of her knitting patterns online so that she could share those with, with friends. And, you know, for the past five years or so, she's, uh, she's run this small business where she'll put uh, knitting patterns online and people will, uh, will uh, either, either pay to download those knitting patterns or um, will pay her for a, for a you know, hard copy of the pattern that then she'll, she'll ship to them. Um, you know, her, her average monthly revenue is, is between four and $5,000 a month um, directly through her online shopping cart, and that's a combination of both the PDF sales and, and hard copy sales. Um, so her business really has kind of two main components. Uh, the first component is selling the, the patterns, um, and then the second is, is an online store for the, for the PDF downloads. Now, Julie didn't set up, to, you know, start up, start off saying, "Oh, I'm going to go build this this uh, huge online business." Um, she really um, said, "Hey, this is this is something that's interesting. Um, I, I, maybe I can make maybe I can little, make a little money on the side as I do this," and, uh, and and it just kind of blossomed over the past several years. Now, when we asked Julie about her her technology stack, uh, things got a little fuzzy. Um, it was clear that Julie knew what she wanted her website to do and, and, and the basics of, of what it took to get it working. But really she didn't understand all the technology behind it and then she admitted that uh, she had used a contractor to kind of put together the technology stack for her. Um, but she's happy that the, the website works, it looks good and, and it makes her a nice, uh, a nice revenue stream. So we dove in a little more in a little more detail at at, at our technology stack. Um, went through our website, looked at uh, you know, looked at the web source and things like that, um, and found out that, that she's using a hosting platform that's based on Linux. Um, her content management is all all run through WordPress, um, with a few um, third-party plugins tuned to her particular needs. 
Um, her e-commerce uh, portion of her website is handled by a third-party uh, proprietary e-commerce plat platform called BigCommerce. Um, her email marketing and newsletter fulfillment is handled by a third party called MailChimp. And any other custom programming that needed to be done, she went to her to her local contractor and, and, and had him do some, some custom PHP programming and whatnot to, to fill in some of the gaps. Um, we we asked Julie to share with us some of the you know, some of our, the, the details on, on what she was spending um, and and you know what are what her costs associated with the with the website were. Um, she she told us that uh, she started out with a very uh, you know, very economical um, e-commerce package, um, switched over to using big commerce when she got to the point where you know she was doing enough in sales that it, that it justified moving to a uh, you know, to a, to a better platform. Um, you know, the, the thing that uh, her and her contractor liked about the big commerce platform is that it had uh, RESTful APIs that they had sample code in a number of different languages, such as PHP and using just using curl directly and using things like Node.js. Um, and uh, you know, she found that she that uh, that in uh, 2011 she had about $35,000 in revenue, about 348,000 unique visitors, um, almost 4,000 completed orders. And uh, and that looked pretty good. And uh, her her year to date numbers on, on 2012 numbers looked uh, like they were, they were growing even even from that. Um, so as I said, their her content management was based on WordPress, um, and then the e-commerce uh, side was was on big commerce. So she spent uh, approximately $13 a month for her hosting um, from her hosting provider. Um, she paid $25 a month for the e-commerce package. Uh, paid nothing for it to use WordPress because it's open source. Um, she was uh, spending about $75 a month on her uh, email marketing campaigns, and uh, and then she was spending uh, approximately $900 a month for additional design and programming costs with a, with a web developer. The the uh, so you know her, her her total cost you know came to about thousand dollars a month, just over a thousand dollars a month, and she, and and she, like I said, used that to generate between four and five thousand dollars a month in return. The second the second case study we want to look at is is uh, another small business uh, online. Um, this is a small business called Castle Chat, CastleChat.com. Um, it was started by Nicole and Brian Sidwar. Um, they live just outside of Orlando, Florida. Um, as you can probably tell from the from the slide here, um, they they started their business because they happened to be um, on vacation at Disney World in Orlando, and they started thinking about well, what kind of business you know could we build around you know helping people when they come to Disney World, and, and could we make a could we make a go of that on the internet? And so they started CastleChat.com, um, and so they're they're you know, working towards setting up a, a full um, Full service website that not only helps people, you know, find where's the best places to eat, you know, what, what are the best things to see, what are the best things to do, but helps as a as an online travel agency as well to help people who you know, who want to come to to Disney World. Um, now, neither Brian nor Nicole had any uh, any programming experience when they started out, but they uh, but they just set out and said, hey, we're going to figure out how to do it. Uh, Brian um, bought himself a few books and and and, and started researching on the web and, and reading forums and mailing lists and whatnot until he figured out how to start building the website. Um, and he started this last uh, March, and they're averaging right now about 7,000 unique visitors per month, and, and within the next few months we anticipate they'll probably be closer to 10,000 uh, unique visitors per month. Um, now they haven't started looking at, at the geographical distribution of their customers yet, um, but they are big fans of knowing as much as they can about their customers, and so that's one of the things that they'll be adding on to their um, their site here. Now you'll notice that this is a little different uh, type of startup than, than than what we showed with uh, with Coco Chat, um, in that that they they just started rolling up their sleeves and, and diving right into it you know, bit by bit. Um, they're doing incremental changes. They, you know, they're, they they don't have one big massive rollout. You know, Brian works on things a little bit at a time and he pushes out changes to the website a little by little. Um, so we we did the same thing with with uh, Castle Chat that we did with Coconuts. We we asked them if we could dive in, take a closer look at their technology stack, 
um, figure out what they're using, um, how they're using it, and, and where their money is being spent. Um, so uh, their hosting base is, is based on Linux, again. Um, all their databases are, are run off of MySQL. Um, lots of PHP code on their, uh, on their website, um, and they only change pieces they know how to change so they don't break anything else. Um, they also have some, some JavaScript on the client side that they use for various things, and all their, their content management system is, is, is based on WordPress. Um, for their, you know, for their sales, their online sales, their e-commerce solution, um, they're using a plugin for WordPress that simply uh, passes uh, the customer off to PayPal for a PayPal checkout form, uh, and uh, they're also starting to add some third-party advertising into their website to help uh, help cover their web costs as well. Um, so let's let's see how the how how their costs came out. Um, you know. They're, they're, uh, they're paying less than $5 a month for hosting. Um, by the time they, they add on you know, a, a few other things um, that they do, their costs are only $44 a month. So it shows you just a, just a, you know, kind of a, a quick representation just between these two case studies um, where Cocoa Nits was spending over $1,000 a month. Um, Castle Chat is, is, has their whole website up and running, um, uh, you know, a simple e-commerce platform and everything for $44 a month. So you know, rough saving is there of $976 a month simply by using open source tools and then taking kind of a do-it-yourself attitude. Um, so we decided to go through this, this scenario and, uh, and say, well, if you were saving $976 a month, you know, if you add that up across 12 months and you basically save you know, $11,700 per year. But there's, there's something else you could do as well. One of the things that, that came out of this Google study that we looked at was that um, if you invest in, in search engine optimization, um, that that helps your website as well. And uh, basically using the numbers that came out of the Google study, we said, well, if, if you invested $500 of that $976 a month in savings, if you took 500 of that and invested it in in search engine optimization, that that would actually save you. You would actually gain an extra sixteen thousand dollars per year over you know, a, a proprietary solution. And then uh, in, in scenario three, we said, well, what if you uh, what if you take the five hundred dollars and and put that into search engine optimization, and then take the the, the rest of the leftover, uh, the four hundred and seventy six dollars per month and invested that in AdWords. And again, based on the ratios that, that Google shared in their research report, um, that adds up to over $50,000 per year in, in additional revenue simply by the, the money that you could – taking the money you saved by using open source and, and putting that into either advertising or search engine optimization. And for any small business, uh, you know, especially a, you know, a, a two-person business that they, they started from scratch, an extra $50,000 a year is, is pretty significant. Okay, I've got a couple of questions here on the, on the chat. We'll answer those and then we'll dive back in. Um, Queen Bee asks, does Bluehost help with SEO? And the answer is absolutely we do. Uh, we have both some, uh, some simple products that you can, you can purchase and, and – uh, help out that way, but we also offer some, some more customized services around search engine optimization uh, to help people really do the, do the best job of, of getting their, their websites recognized by the search engines and, and, and help out their placement in, within those search engine rankings. Uh, the next question is, how do you handle updates for changes in security issues and rules? Um, this gets a little complicated, but I'll, I'll do the best to I'll do my best to explain it in as short a time as possible here on the webcast. Um, you know, web hosts take security very seriously. Um, you know, the, the last thing anybody wants to have happen is to get uh, to have their website their website defaced or have their website uh, you know, infected with malware or things like that. Um, when you're a web hosting company and you host millions and millions of domains, obviously that that uh, becomes increasingly important. Um, we use a number of tools in, inside of Bluehost to, to take care of the security um, of our customers. We're actively monitoring for, for changes to, 
you know, to, to web content that, that looks malicious, that, that doesn't look right. Um, we actively encourage um, our customers to update to the latest version of, of software packages. Um, for example, if you're using you know, WordPress as your content management system on Bluehost system, uh, whenever you log into the, the control panel, it will tell you, hey, there's a new version of WordPress uh, available. Would you like to update now? And our simple scripts installer can do a one-quick upgrade and, and of, of the latest version of WordPress for you. Um, you'll get that, uh, that notification that there's an updated version um, both through the, 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 the WordPress uh, dashboard, obviously, but also if you just log into the, 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 the control panel um, within your domain management system, um, you'll, you'll get that notification as well to try to notify you, hey, there's, a, there's an update out there. It, 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 it solves some security issues. You may want to update. We're also working on some, some uh, programs that we should be rolling out shortly, working with communities like WordPress to, to, to be a little more proactive and find out if there's, change, there's times when it makes sense to, to proactively push out security updates rather than wait for the customers to be reactive. All right. So Really what it comes down to um, when all is said and done is money, right? Or, or what is the economic impact of, you know, of open source across small businesses? Um, I, I, I kind of walked through the, the math on how, how we calculated that with, with the two case studies, but if you take a step back and, and apply that to, to, the, uh, to the Bluehost customers as a whole, um, add up the math, we found that Bluehost customers alone experience a $12.4 billion economic impact on their business thanks to open source. You know, if you were to take that uh, $12.4 billion just for Bluehost customers, um, extrapolate that out, you know, considering that Bluehost is you know, between 10 and 15% of the, of the hosting market, um, that gives you an idea what, a, what an impact um, just, just in, the, in, the, in the hosting side alone um, open source has on the small business economy. Uh, it is absolutely true that open source is the, is the engine that drives small businesses online, and small businesses, particularly those small businesses who have invested online, are the economic engine of the, of the U.S. economy. So where does that... Uh, where does that leave us? One of the things we do at, uh, at Bluehost is we have something we call our BOSS program. Um, BOSS stands for Bluehost Open Source Services, and one of the things that I do on the, on the BOSS team is help open source communities um, to grow, to thrive, to reach new customers, um, and those sorts of things. We do that through a number of areas. We do that by um, sponsoring um, open source communities, sponsoring open source events, um, in some cases, we hire um, programmers to work, work full-time on, on open source applications. So for example, um, we've got a, a small team of developers working on, on WordPress. And uh, their, their job is to work full-time giving back to the WordPress community, working on the things that the WordPress community um, finds useful. And I would uh, hope to be able to expand that program to cover um, some of the other open source applications as well. Um, we also uh, build training videos for things like uh, WordPress or Drupal or Joomla or other open source applications um, to help people get up and running and get started in, uh, in running those applications. And uh, we also have a, a one-click installer that I mentioned before called Simple Scripts that not only we use internally at Bluehost, but we, um, that, you know, we, we allow any web hosting company that wants to to use that installer to make it very, very simple to um, you know, install open source applications from a catalog of, I think there's between 80 and 100 uh, open source applications on the list right now, or with one click you can say, oh, I want to install WordPress quick, or I want to install Drupal one click, or I want to install Joomla, or I want to install Zenfoto, or PrestaShop, or, or one of any number of, uh, of open source web applications. It makes it very easy to, for customers to get up and running in those applications, and also just try them out and see what see how those uh, applications work for them. So um, I'm, I'm very proud to be able to, you know, uh, to, to be a shovel that helps uh, get work done and help, help out the open source communities and really make, make an impact in, in the world out there. That finishes up kind of the, the formal part of the, 
the webcast today, but I did want to leave some time here for, for some additional questions and answers. We've had some good questions so far, but I'm sure there's others out there who uh, have been saving their questions to the end. And so I will uh, uh, take some time here to answer some questions. Again, I'll be looking at the, at the group chat functionality, or um, you can go through the question and answer section on the, uh, on the webcast tool, and, uh, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Jared. Um, as we wait for folks to uh, send in their questions, and again, folks, if you have questions for what Jared was talking to you about today, please do open your group chat, send that in so he can answer it while he's with us. And if you join us a little bit later in the program, we do have a radar report that um, Jared and his company helped write with O'Reilly Media. We push out a little um, bit of information to you all, and it's coming up to you now. It's going to open in another tab on your computer. You can download that report excellent information in that report. You need to read it. It's good for your day-to-day -day and what you're doing. Okay, as we, we'll give you folks just a couple more minutes here while Jared's with us. He'll answer your questions. And while we're waiting for some of those questions to roll in, I, I've got my uh, email address and, and Twitter handle on the, on the screen as well. If, if you'd rather you know, contact us offline it, um, to get more, either get more information or if you're part of a a, an open source community that, that would like to get in and, as part of the BOSS program or, or those sorts of things, feel free to reach out to me either at open source at bluehost.com or at Jay Smith on Twitter. Okay, I have a question here. How much of your web hosting operations are temporary contract programmers versus in-house programmers? Um, so from, from, web ho from, uh, from Bluehost uh, in particular, um, we, we employ uh, a large number of, of full-time in-house programmers uh, for building things, both building our internal tools, uh, systems administrators, obviously people in our, in our call centers with, with tech support, quality assurance, uh, billing, um, those sorts of things. Um, most, of, most of what we do, we do in-house, um, but uh, so there are there are some third parties that are available to help with things like uh, theming and and uh, you know, customized marketing campaigns and those sorts of things as well. Does that answer your question? Okay. The next question that came through is how does Bluehost provide end user support for the open source projects they deploy? That's a very good question. Um, the, the, the short answer is the, you know, the best we can. Um, obviously, it depends on the open source application and, and the type of problem that the, that the customers are experiencing. Um, for things that we're fairly, fairly you know, familiar with, things like WordPress, um, we really try to do a good job of helping customers get up and running with WordPress, um, you know, solve their day-to-day their, their -day maintenance issues. Um, we don't always support all the third-party plugins or all the possible combinations and things you could do, especially if you're doing custom programming, um, you know, PHP and those sorts of things for WordPress. But we really try to reach out to our customers, um, help them um, you know, with the basics, get them up and running, and get their, get their theme installed, those, those sorts of things. And uh, the other thing we do is we, we take an active role in those communities. Um, so, for example, like I said, in the WordPress community, we have you know, people on staff that are that are you know core contributors to Word, WordPress. We also actively um, look through the through the forums and mailing lists for open source communities but to look for customers who happen to be our customers that are asking for help there to see if we can we can reach out and help them through our through our support efforts as well. Um, really, it really comes down to you know being a part of these open source communities so that we know them well enough to be able to take care of our customers and help people out. And that's something we're always looking to do, to do better at. Okay, the next question that came through was from Alberto. Alberto asks, first of all, thank you for the webcast. How can you show to other people how managed development companies that open source is the best option? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I've spent a lot of time in open source communities, um, building open source communities, helping them to, to, to outreach to people. Um, there's not one easy way to, to show people that, uh, that open source is the best option, um, but there's lots, lots of ways that you can kind of point them in that direction. Um, point them at, at the success of, of things like WordPress. I'll, I'll use WordPress as an example here. Um, something like 
but like I pointed out earlier, something like 55% uh, of, of the, the accounts that are doing content management on, on, on Bluehost hosting um, are using WordPress. Um, you know, and it's, it's amazing to me to watch and see how, how the WordPress community grows and, uh, and thrives and develops. Um, one, uh, one statistic that, uh, that, that, that came out of uh, some of the research we did r around WordPress is that there's more than 75 million websites out there um, running WordPress today with more than 350 million people viewing more than 2.5 billion pages each month just in, in WordPress uh, things alone. So, so you can point um, development companies at, at things like WordPress and, and say, look, you, know, you, can, you, can, you can write an application and, and make it proprietary, but no matter how many smart people you hire, there's always going to be many, many more smart people on the outside who would be happy to contribute to your, you know, to your application if you only gave them a chance. And, and unfortunately, the proprietary model doesn't do a good job of, uh, of getting input from, from outside people who, who have a vested interest in, in making that work. Whereas the open source model is all about you know, encouraging um, input, feedback, contribution, collaboration from, from outsiders. Um, you know, I, th I think we still got a ways to, to, to go to show, um, particularly development companies, um, that that open source is, is is a viable model, that that open source works and works well from a from a development standpoint. But I think we're slowly slow, slowly starting to convince people that that does work, and, and we can show them numerous examples of of, of organizations and, and, and projects where that's worked and worked well. All right, folks, Jared is still with us for a couple more minutes here. If you do have questions for him, please do send them in. Oh, there's another one for you, Jared. Okay, the next question. What are the hottest skill sets for independent programmers who have to be sought after to contribute to open source projects? Um, you know, that, that's a, a really interesting question. One of the things that we, we, we did a, a deep dive on in the, in the research paper, if you turn to the very, the, the very last section in the in the research paper, um, we did a, a, a section on programming language trends and, and looked at, you know, what programming languages are, are, are the hottest when it comes to um, both, you know, applications being run on our hosting platform as well as O'Reilly had access to a, a lot of jobs data, um, you know, job, you know, job seeking, um, you know, applicants looking for jobs uh, from, from, from their, their data. And so we looked at some of the trends in that. Um, the, the, the languages most in use on, on the hosting side are definitely PHP and JavaScript. Um, on the, you know, we, we looked at uh, other programming languages such as Python. Python is seeing an increase in, in, in popularity on the, on the jobs front, but not necessarily a, a huge increase on the hosting side, at least on web hosting. Um, we looked at, uh, at the Perl um, language. It, it's uh, growing slightly, but that's still a little bit flat, particularly on, on, the, on the web ap application side. It tends to be used more for scripting and kind of back-end uh, processing than, than, than simply web development. Um, we, looked, uh, we looked at C-sharp to try to get a, a feel for you know, some of the languages that are typically used more on a proprietary side rather than the, than the open source side. Um, we looked at that, and it looked uh, fairly flat um, as far as, uh, you know, kind of web development um, is concerned. Um, the, other, the other interesting uh, um, language that we spent some time looking at was the Ruby uh, community, because Ruby yeah, tends to be used in, 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 in a lot of newer projects, a lot of kind of up-and-coming um, projects, and so we saw, saw some huge growth in in people looking to hire Ruby programmers, but we didn't see a corresponding spike in people actually using Ruby on, at least on our on our hosting side. Um, it was it it was almost non-existent that people were actually using Ruby um, for their web development projects. So uh, if if I had to throw out what I think are the the hottest skill sets for independent programmers, I would say um, for web development, um, 
PHP is still king, even though it, it gets uh, mocked a lot um, in the programming circles. Um, it's a very, very useful tool, even if it's the mo not the most elegant of languages. Um, obviously, having database, database skills, either MySQL or Postgres, um, that's very, very important, as well as some of the new up-and-coming kind of NoSQL databases. Um, CouchDB tends to be uh, fairly hot um, right now. Um, other, other skills, um, JavaScript, um, both on the, on the front end, on the client side, with things like jQuery and, and things like that, as well as uh, JavaScript on the back end with things like Node.js. Um, JavaScript continues to grow um, quite quickly. Um, it, it's, it's made a, a huge resurgence over the past uh, couple of years as, as more and more people take it seriously and, and do some really incredible things with JavaScript. I guess, yeah, if I had to name, you know, three or four skills that I, I, I would think are, are really important, um, web development in something like PHP or Ruby, um, you know, database skills in MySQL or Postgres, and then uh, JavaScript skills, I think, are the, are the top three that we found. All right, I think we've got time probably for one more question, and then we'll uh, go ahead and close out the webcast. Oh, I actually see a question on Twitter. Somebody's asking about what your thoughts are on Drupal. Do you see any benefit of using that as a language skill set? Okay. So uh, we we found that uh, that Drupal as a content management system isn't as popular as as WordPress, um, and in a, in a slightly behind Joomla. So it kind of comes in third place on the content management side. Um, that being said, Drupal tended to be, tended to be used, especially on, on content management systems that were more complex, that, that used more dynamic data. Um, and I've been a long time uh, Drupal user and even contributed a few patches back to the Drupal community. I think Drupal is a great content management system. Um, it's, you know, it can do some, some absolutely amazing things. Um, sometimes it is a little complex to set up, and I think that's one thing that, that the Drupal community understands and is trying to trying to work on in, in, in the next version of Drupal, in Drupal 8, is that they're trying to make that, that you know, easier to configure, easier to set up for the first time user, and, and then going through some things to help people wrap their head around the, kind of the, the third party modules that you need to add on to Drupal to make a, a Drupal site successful. One last thing here is, is I'm going to push out to your screen just the, the credits for the photos that I used in my, in my presentation today. Uh, the, the, the photos all came from, from Flickr. Um, they're all licensed under the Creative Commons license because we love open source. And so I just wanted to give attribution back to the, uh, the, to the folks who, uh, who made their photos available on Flickr for me to use. Uh, in the webcast. Okay, one last question here. We have a, a question from Tomas. He asks, what is the trend about database, uh, MariaDB, uh, MongoDB? Um, honestly, from our side, on the web hosting side, we see very little use of either of those so far. Um, other places in open source and, and the communities I follow, um, Maria is starting to get a, a little bit of, of, of an uptick, especially as, as, as things you know, continue to change and, and, and develop on, on, on MySQL over the last year or so. Um, MongoDB, I see a lot of people um, experimenting with MongoDB. I see less people actually going out and using it in production environments, especially for, for web development type applications. Um, it's it's you know it's it's an interesting concept. I played around with it some myself, um, and I think it's it's still on on, on kind of the, the the cutting edge. And I, I I'm it'll be interesting to see over the next year or so um, as that uh, you know as as it grows and develops to see how things like MongoDB and, and MariaDB and some of the other you know, databases um, you know. Whether, whether they really see a, a strong uptick in, in production use as opposed to kind of, you know, rapid prototyping and in, in, in experimental use. Great. Thank you so much, Jared, for such an outstanding webcast that you presented for us all today. We'd also like to say a very big thank you to Bluehost for sponsoring today's webcast. And we learned today from Jared's presentation that open source makes an enormous contribution to the economy, and the exact impact is difficult to quantify. 
Uh, this past summer, Bluehost and O'Reilly did work together to explore the world of open source and to quantify the economic impact on the small business economy. Today's webcast expounded on the conclusions offered in the July 2012 O'Reilly Radar Report with insights drawn from the real-world data provided by Bluehost. And that was just excellent information for us all today, and it really does open our eyes and see how open source does help us and does save us a lot of money. Folks that attended, we thank you for attending today's webcast and hope you benefited from it. Again, we thank you, Jared. We thank Bluehost. This will conclude today's webcast. Goodbye, everyone.